now, here he is, Tom Likas. Thank you for tuning in to the Tom Likas Show. This is where America gets together to talk about the issues you really care about. It's an every kind of a radio talk program. We're the radio talk show that is not hosted by a right-wing wacker or a convicted felon. No! I... I am your host. Write down our telephone number. You're going to need it. It's 1 800 5 800 Tom. 1 800 5 800 866. Thank you for tuning in. Thanks for being part of our program. Here we are together again on the radio. One of the days I love coming to work. I mean, <laughs> it's a great job. I got to tell you, it's a great career. It's a great life. Everything I tell you is true. But there are some days when I am chomping at the bit to get in. To work. Because things happen at just the right time during the day that I can absorb them, get to know them intimately, and then come in here and just kick butt. And that's what I aim to do here. This is so good. It's so juicy. And I want to send out a gracious good afternoon to all the good folks of New York City who think New York is superior. It's the center of the universe. It's the culture capital of the world. Yeah. Hello, folks. <laughs> Let's talk a little bit about client number nine. <laughs> Have you heard this story yet? If you haven't heard it, this is as good as it gets. A lot of New Yorkers were lording. The New Yorkers love lording, you know, anything they can over anybody else. You know, our team's better than your team. Just don't mention the NBA to a New Yorker. You know, our subway's better than your subway. Our hot dogs are better than your hot dogs. And then uh, a couple of years ago, you had that uh, Governor Jim McGreevy of New Jersey. Remember that guy? Remember his deal, right? He's the governor. He was uh, elected with uh, quite a nice cushion, and uh, everyone was thinking this guy is just great. Isn't this great? New Jersey, great governor. And then uh, steps up to the plate and announces he's got this uh, this other life going on. He's got a lover. He's gay. His wife didn't know about it. And he resigns. And I know that that was the butt of many, many jokes from New Yorkers. Well, that's... Uh, Let's talk about good old Elliot Spitzer, the governor of New York State. Also known by the feds as client number nine. Now, you may not know who L. Elliot Spitzer is, but uh, Elliot Spitzer for eight years was the attorney general of the state of New York. Now, by the way. I have not lived in New York in 27 years. I do not identify myself as a New Yorker, and I couldn't care less as far as I'm concerned if that place just uh, kind of disintegrated and floated away into the ocean. I wouldn't be the least bit concerned about it. That's how I feel about it. So believe me when I tell you I'm not coming here as a New Yorker in any way, shape, or form. Elliot, but, but but how do I know about Elliot Spitzer? Not because I've lived in New York State or have cared less about it, but because I watch CNBC. And Elliot Spitzer was on CNBC several days a week. This guy was on there all the time. You know CNBC, it's the business channel. And he was constantly coming on CNBC to tell you the next uh, the next target he had for law enforcement. And uh, boy, he had a big list, big list of things he wanted to do. He was one of the people screaming about Enron when the Enron scandal was beginning. He was the guy who aimed to clean up the mutual fund industry. He's the guy who revealed through his investigations that the mutual fund industry was allowing uh, big investors to unfairly invest in mutual funds after the trading day was over. Like, let's say the market cratered 150 points. You can't invest in your mutual fund after uh, 1 p.m. Pacific time, 4 p.m. Eastern time. Um, his investigation discovered that big investors 
could say, hey, uh, you mind if we uh, stick $200 million in this mutual fund after hours now that we know the price has dropped? And uh, that was ferried out, and many mutual fund companies uh, suffered uh, fines, punishment, uh, lost uh, billions of dollars in assets as people fled for other companies. What was all due to Elliot Spitzer's investigations? Elliot Spitzer is also behind an investigation of the radio industry, the payola and plugola part of the industry. Uh, we don't play any songs, so we don't get to participate in any of that good stuff. But uh, whoever was allegedly and in some cases, in fact, participating, Elliot Spitzer ferreted a certain number of them out, especially in New York State. So he was the attorney general. And this is what he did. And he was always he was one of these press conference guys. He was always holding press conferences. He was always on television. He, he didn't just arrest people. He didn't just investigate people. This guy had to have FaceTime on TV. Which he did. And then uh, he decided he wanted to convert all the goodwill he'd built up over the years. And become the governor of New York State. And among the things he promised to do, he promised to clean up prostitution. One of the promises he made when he got elected. <laughs> yeah, good to clean it up. Well, I think now we're getting an idea of what his methods might have been. One good way to clean up prostitution would be to keep all the prostitutes as busy as possible so nobody else can hire them. <laughs> that might be one method you might use. Elliot Spitzer, a year ago, was elected the governor of New York State after eight years as attorney general. And there was a new sheriff in town that he was coming to clean up. Oh, yeah. I'm the law enforcement guy. I was the attorney general for eight years, and now I'm coming in to clean up. Which leads us to the events of today. This from the New York Times, Dayline Albany, New York. Governor Elliot Spitzer, who gained national prominence relentlessly pursuing Wall Street wrongdoing, has been caught on a federal wiretap arranging to meet with a high-priced prostitute at a Washington hotel last month, according to a law enforcement official, and a person briefed on the investigation. The wiretap captured a man identified as Client 9, on a telephone call confirming plans to have a woman travel from New York to Washington, where he had reserved a hotel room, according to an affidavit filed in federal court in Manhattan. The person briefed on the case and the law enforcement official identified Mr. Spitzer as Client 9. Says here, and of course the New York Times, so they're very formal there. Mr. Spitzer, a first-time Democrat whose name rhymes with Mr. I found that entertaining. Mr. Spitzer. <laughs> kind of a tongue twister. Today made a brief public appearance during which he apologized for behavior. And here's, let's listen to this apology, okay? Because this story, the uh, the original rudimentary form of this story appeared on the New York Times webpage uh, earlier today. And then we heard that uh, Elliot Spitzer was going to have a press conference, and people were pretty much speculating the guy's going to come out here, and he's going to go boo-hoo-hoo, and he's going to say, sorry to everybody he hurt, and he's going to resign. Well, that's not quite what happened. Here is what happened. For the past nine years, eight years as attorney general, and one as governor, I've tried to uphold a vision of progressive politics that would rebuild New York and create opportunity for all. We sought to bring real change to New York, and that will continue. Today, I want to briefly address a private matter. I have acted in a way that violates my obligations to my family and that violates my or any sense of right and wrong. I apologize first and most importantly to my family. I apologize to the public whom I promised better. I do not believe that politics in the long run is about individuals. It is about ideas, the public good, and doing what is best for the state of New York. But I have disappointed and failed to live up to the standard I expected of myself. I must now dedicate some time to regain the trust of my family. I will not be taking questions. 
Thank you very much. I will report back to you in short order. Report back much. in short order. You shouldn't be the governor anymore. That should have been the moment you said, I quit. And can I tell you why, Elliot? While I'm at it, you're an attorney. Attorneys can't be breaking the law. Okay? That's the way it is. When you pass the bar and you were sworn in or whatever it is, whatever the process is to become an attorney, uh, you are promising you're not going to break the law. Okay? At hiring a prostitute uh, in New York State and Washington, D.C., and pretty much most of the United States, with the exception of a few counties in Nevada and what have you, it's pretty much illegal. So in addition to you being, it's, it's like the, uh, of course, how, who reads anymore? But there was that Ray Bradbury book called Fahrenheit 451. That movie, Fahrenheit 9-11, the title didn't come from nowhere. In fact, it didn't make any sense. But that's because it was uh, borrowed from the book Fahrenheit 451. And the plot of this science fiction novel by Ray Bla Bradbury, in, in a nutshell... Uh, you've got the fire department that's out there, uh, unbeknownst to people, they are, they're starting fires. That's essentially the, that's essentially the story. And it's got a moral, of course. And the moral is, I guess, essentially, you know what, if you, if you stand out there and say, I'm the fire department, you better not get caught starting fires, okay? Fahrenheit 451, by the way, at 451 degrees Fahrenheit is the temperature at which paper will burn. You know, that's more information than you got in two years of community college, son, on the Tom Likas show. But you can't be going up there, Elliot Spitzer, and saying, well, I'm going to clean up the prostitution in New York State and then get caught on a wiretap uh, as client number nine. You can't do that. Well, why didn't he resign? By the way, what's he apologizing for? Didn't deny what the New York Times said. So if you didn't deny it and you're apologizing, can, would it be fair to surmise that you did what they said you did? God damn it, there's a tape of this somewhere. <laughs> and by the way, as soon as that tape is available, you know where you're going to be hearing it. Right here. <laughs> On the Tom Likas show. That's right. Client number nine. So, and by the way, you had to see the wife. This was... Uh, this was shown live on television today, although for some reason CNN, did, yeah, Gary, you were watching CNN. CNN didn't have a camera in New York City Hall. So they had Elliot Spitzer on the phone. I thought he was calling CNN with this apology. Later it turned out there was a video of this, but CNN apparently didn't have a camera down there. That's good. <laughs> what happens when something really important happens? Are they going to get caught short like 9-11? They're going to have to ask people who's got a cell phone camera downtown? Is that what it's going to be? Jesus. So anyway, uh, I'm watching this on TV today, and there's the wife. These political wives, you know, is it really worth it, honey? Come on. There you are with the big clanky necklace on and the perfect hair, and your eyes are all swollen, and you're... Because <laughs> you just found out that you've been sleeping with client number nine, allegedly. Let me know where this is going. <laughs> it's too good. Says here in the New York Times story before speaking, Mr. Spitzer stood with his arm around his wife. The two nodded. <laughs> I wonder what that was about. And then strode forward together to face more than 100 reporters. Both had glassy, tear-filled eyes, but they did not cry. Well, he found out about this on Friday, apparently. So I bet they did a lot of crying over the weekend. Because he may not just have to resign as governor. This guy may not be able to be an attorney anymore. That could happen. That could happen. Probably won't happen, but it could. As he went to leave, three reporters called out, Are you resigning? Are you resigning? And Mr. Spitzer charged out of the room, slamming the door. <laughs> Says here the governor learned that he had been implicated in the prostitution inquiry when a federal official contacted his staff on Friday, according to the person briefed on the case. The governor informed his top aide Sunday night, after a weekend of begging in front of his wife, I just added that part, 
and this morning of his involvement. He canceled his public events today and scheduled the announcement for this afternoon after increase from the New York Times. The governor's aides appeared shaken before he spoke, and one of them began to weep as they waited for him to make his statement. Oh, it was at his Manhattan office. Somebody on CNN was wrong. They said it was City Hall in New York. What do they know? Oh, yes. Now, I'll take a break here because I, I, I don't want to interrupt the good stuff that's coming up. And, boy, there's more good stuff coming up here because, I, you know what? I have no problem with people who have a checkered past. You know me. I've done all kinds of bad things, and I tell you about it. You know, I've been married, divorced, screwed around, smoked weed, done mushrooms. Yeah. I've been a very bad boy. I've had you know, multiple sex partners at the same time. I, I, I don't know what else I could tell you that I did. I was arrested on domestic violence charges. I get on the list because, uh, you know, in my business, it pays to be notorious. <laughs> if I hide anything, it's just going to cost me. But I love it when these guys come in. I, and by the way, I don't care if they're officials. I don't care if they're ministers. I don't care if they're radio personalities. Anybody who says, you know, I'm perfect, follow me. We're going back to Senator Gary Hart in the 80s, who got caught uh, screwing around uh, uh, way back when, when he was thinking about running for president. Or he may have been running for president. Who remembers him anymore? Or, uh, of course, uh, the, the religious guys, Jim Baker, Jimmy Swaggered, they got caught. Please forgive me. I'm sorry. And, uh, of course, who could ever forget Dr. Laura? Showing off her untrimmed hedges uh, for, uh, 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 what's his name? Bo Balance. Oh. Yes. All these perfect people who are going to tell you how to behave, and then you find out how they behave when you're not looking. So now we've got client number nine here, also known as the governor of New York State, apparently. And uh, here he is. He's going to try. He's going to try to get the people of New York City. Those yutzes in the bleachers at Yankee Stadium who, uh, you know, throw batteries at people and uh, threaten to kill them. Uh, they, he's going to try to get these people to accept the idea that the guy who's going to clean our prostitution uh, sits there at the Mayflower Hotel in Washington, D.C. and awaits the delivery of his prostitute. That That's perfectly okay. I have got, and this is from the smokinggun.com, I have got the actual federal documents right here. With all the details the government says uh, took place here. Now, again, these are all allegations by the government. Your innocence is proven guilty. Hardy, har, har. Okay, fine. We'll accept that. He hasn't been proven guilty yet, but wait until you hear what's coming up. It's going to knock your socks off. Tom Likas. Like 1-800-5800-TOM. I'm 42, and I'd love to bang an 18-year-old. That'd be great. It's the Tom Likas Show. It's the Tom Likas Show. <laughs> Feedback. At one 800 800 tom That's our telephone number. Hey, fans can have feedback on stage. Why not me? That's right. What the hell? I'm just in that kind of mood. I am uh, just enjoying the crap out of this story, i got to tell you. Let me uh, read to you, first of all, from the New York Times story, the part that uh, I left out here because uh, I wanted to do this all together. This is about New York State Governor Elliot Spitzer, who now it turns out is being investigated by uh, the feds for allegedly being client number nine in a wiretapping investigation of a prostitution ring. <laughs> says here in the New York Times, the man described as client nine in the affidavit arranged to meet with a prostitute who was part of the ring. It was called Emperor's Club VIP. On the night of February 13th, happy Valentine's Day, honey. Yeah. Oh, honey, I'd love to be with you on Valentine's Day, but I have to go to Washington, D.C. and uh, meet a hooker at the Mayflower Hotel. Sorry, honey, I'll make it up to you. Yeah. Says your Mr. Spitzer traveled to Washington that evening, according to a person told of his travel arrangements. So he's taking my advice. He's uh, ducking out of town on Valentine's Day. That's great. Of course, offering to pay over $5,000 for a night with a hooker, not recommended. 
The affidavit says that Client 9 met with the woman, met with the woman. <laughs> they got together in hotel room 871, but does not identify the hotel. Mr. Spitzer did stay at the Mayflower Hotel in Washington on February the 13th, according to a source who was told of his travel arrangements. Room 871 at the Mayflower Hotel that evening was registered under the names under the, under the name George Fox. <laughs> George Fox. What was that name that George Costanza used to use all the time? Vandalay. What was the first name? It was George Vandalay. Art Vandalay. That's right. That would have been a good one to use, but no, he used the name George Fox. By the way, uh, the law enforcement official said that several people running the prostitution ring knew Mr. Spitzer by the name of George Fox, though a few of the prostitutes came to realize he was the governor of New York. <laughs> I'm the governor, God damn it! I'm the governor! Mr. Fo there is a George Fox. Do you know there's a real George Fox? He's a friend and a donor to Mr. Spitzer. <laughs> now, that's a friend. Gary, I'm checking into the Mayflower Hotel uh, on Valen the night before Valentine's Day. Can I say I'm Gary Zabransky at the hotel? Oh, wait, I think I have to. <laughs> now, that's a friend. <laughs> I don't do it anymore. <laughs> You don't have to worry. No one's going to ask you about that anymore. Okay. So here's what they did. The New York Times called George Fox, the real George Fox. And they did a telephone interview with him, and they asked him whether he accompanied Mr. Spitzer to Washington, which would be another whole show. Maybe they could have brought uh, Jim McGreevy along with them and had a really great evening. Um, whether he accompanied Mr. Spitzer to Washington on February the 13th and February the 14th. Mr. Fox responded, why would you think that? I did not. Told that room 871 at the Renaissance Mayflower Hotel, a hotel where Gary and I have stayed, by the way. Have you been with me in Washington, D.C., Gary? I don't think so. You haven't been there with me? Because I've stayed at the Mayflower Hotel. I've been there. Oh, yes. Yes, told that the room was registered in Mr. Fox's name, but with Mr. Spitzer's Fifth Avenue address... Mr. Fox said, this is the first I've heard of it. Until I speak to the governor further, I have no comment. <laughs> now, they know George Fox was not at the Mayflower Hotel, but his name was, along with client number nine. Federal prosecutors rarely charge clients in prostitution cases, which are generally seen as state crimes. But the Mann Act, that's two ends. Don't get too excited. Passed by Congress in 1910 to address prostitution, human trafficking, and what was viewed at the time as immorality in general. <laughs> Makes it a crime to transport someone between states for the purpose of prostitution. Four defendants charged in the case, unsealed last week, were all charged with that crime along with several others. Oh, yes. Though his signature issue was pursuing Wall Street misdeeds, as New York State Attorney General Mr. Spitzer also had prosecuted at least two prostitution rings as head of the state's organized crime task force. In one such case in 2004, Mr. Spitzer spoke with revulsion and anger after announcing the arrest of 16 people for operating a high-end prostitution ring on Staten Island. <laughs> you know why he was upset? How many high-end people are on Staten Island? Why would you put it out there? Stupid idea. Just because Staten Island rejected NASCAR, come on. At the time, Mr. Spitzer said this was a sophisticated and lucrative operation with a multi-tiered management structure. It was, however, nothing more than a prostitution ring. I wonder he knows so much about this. So now the uh, smokinggun.com, and you know what? I, I, I hate to take another break here, but I want to get it in now so I can read all of this great material to you.
And by the way, we are putting it up on our website, blowmeuptom.com. It is linked. If you want to read this and get a little head start on what we're going to read to you, or you just want to get a good, big, fat laugh at all the New Yorkers who are always trying to lord it over you that they're from New York. You guys ain't got no culture out here. Who's your governor? Arnold Schwarzenegger? <laughs> yeah. Who's your governor? <laughs> All right, we will come back uh, with uh, the details from the smoking gun, the actual documents in the Elliot Spitzer case, and then your telephone calls will be coming up. Sound like it. 1-800-5800-TOM. 1-800-5800-866. I support the feminists. Are you a feminist? Yes, I am. Really? Yeah, they're 100% equal to men. I don't pay for nothing. It's the Tom Likas Show. It's the Tom Likas Show from Hollywood as far as, as far from Elliot Spitzer as you can get. All right, we've linked to this on our website, so uh, you can go look at it, savor it, read it for yourself. There's a new sheriff in town. He's going to clean up prostitution when he's not calling prostitutes. <laughs> All right, here it is. This is from The Smoking Gun. I'm going to read it straight out. It says here with the bombshell news today that New York Governor Elliot Spitzer has been implicated in a prostitution ring. The Democratic politician will now always be known as Client 9. One of the Johns described in a recently unsealed FBI affidavit detailing the operation of the Emperor's Club and International Call Girl Ring. That document, an excerpt of which you'll find below, describes hooker interactions with 10 Johns, including one client who paid cash for a February 13th rendezvous at a Washington, D.C. hotel. The New York Times, which broke the Spitzer story, has identified the 48-year-old politician as Client 9. As described in the FBI document, Client 9, clearly a repeat customer, apparently went to great lengths to arrange the illicit Washington encounter, choosing to mail money in advance to the ring instead of using a credit card. Client 9, whose conversations were recorded by an FBI wiretap, would not do, quote, traditional wire transferring. The affidavit quotes one Emperor's Club employee remarking. Additionally, the affidavit notes that after her appointment with Client 9 ended, Kristen, in quotes, because these girls never use their real names, spoke with an Emperor's Club booker who said she had been told that Client 9, quote, would ask you to do things that, like, you might not think were safe. Riding bareback, Governor? <laughs> Kristen responded by saying essentially that she can handle guys like that. Now, uh, here we go. This is the, uh, and I'm reading from the actual documents here because it's just too good. And you can read all of this on our website, blowmeuptom.com. Just uh, click on through to the smoking gun. You'll see it right there. This is paragraph 70 from the uh, FBI documents. On February 7th, 2008, at approximately 12.13 a.m., Tanya Hollander, the defendant, using the 1627 number, it's a phone number, and they were sending text messages, sent a text message to Cecil Suwal, a.k.a. Katie, a.k.a. Kate, the defendant, from the 3390 number. I guess that's her phone number. In the text message, Hollander wrote, quote, and in parentheses it says, an Emperor's Club client eight, would like to fly Falana out to Las Vegas on Friday. Do you think that is an okay first appointment for her? Paragraph 71, on February 11th, 2008, at approximately 9.28 p.m., Cecil Sewall, a.k.a. Katie, a.k.a. Kate, the defendant using the 3390 number, received a call from a representative of client eight. During the call, the representative, who said he was calling on behalf of Client 8, asked if Falata would be available for Friday night. So all informed the representative that Client 8 would have to pay a deposit to the Emperor's Club to secure Falata's transportation to Las Vegas. Suwal and the representative discussed Client 8 sending a wire transfer to pay for the deposit. Now, paragraph 72, notwithstanding the foregoing calls on February 12th, 2008 at 9.58 p.m., Tamika Rochelle Lewis, a.k.a. Rochelle, the defendant, 
using the 6587 phone number. Spoke with Client Aid's representative. Lewis told the representative that Falana would not be available for the appointment with Client 8. Now we get to uh, paragraph 73, which comes under the heading Interstate Transportation from New York to Washington, D.C. And this is where it gets into allegations of violating the Mann Act. This is a federal law, and it can be pretty dicey if the governor of New York State is accused of violating you know, this particular law. Says here, on February 11th, 2008, at approximately 10.53 p.m., Tamika Rochelle Lewis, a.k.a. Rochelle, the defendant, using the 6587 number, sent a text message to Cecil Sewall, a.k.a. Katie, a.k.a. Kate, the defendant, at the 3390 number. In the text message, Lewis wrote, and now we're getting down to the person alleged to be the governor of New York State, please let me know if Client 9's package believed to be a reference to a deposit of money sent by mail, arrives tomorrow. Appointment Wednesday. Appointment on Wednesday. Some abbreviations here I can't understand. Oh, appointment would be on Wednesday. It's text message. Yeah. So I'll send a text message back to Lewis stating K as in OK. Paragraph 74, on February 12, 2008, at approximately 2.37 p.m., Tamika Rochelle Lewis, a.k.a. Rochelle, we'll call her Rochelle from now on because you know who we're talking about, uh, called a prostitute who the Emperor's Club marketed using the name Kristen, in quotes. During the call, Lewis left a message for Kristen that the deposit had not arrived today, but that they should be able to do the trip if the deposit arrived tomorrow. At approximately 4.03 p.m., Lewis received a call from Kristen. During the call, Kristen said that she had heard the message, and that was fine. Lewis and Kristen then discussed the time that Kristen would take the train from New York to Washington, D.C. Lewis told Kristen that there was a 5.39 p.m. train that arrived at 9 p.m., and that Kristen would be taking the train out of Penn Station. Lewis confirmed that Client 9 would be paying for everything. Uh, train tickets, cab fare from the hotel and back, mini bar, or room service, travel time, and hotel. Lewis said that they would probably not know until 3 p.m. if the deposit arrived because Client 9 would not do traditional wire transferring. Client 9 is alleged to be the governor of New York State, Elliot Spitzer, in case you forgot. At approximately 8.12 p.m., Rochelle, the defendant, received a call from Client 9. During the call, Lewis told Client 9 that the, quote, package did not arrive today. Lewis asked Client 9 if there was a return address on the envelope, and Client 9 said no. Lewis asked, you had QAT. I don't know what QAT is. And Client 9 said, yep, same as in the past, no question about it. Lewis asked Client 9 what time he was interested in having the appointment tomorrow. Client 9 told her 9 p.m. or 10 p.m. Lewis told Client 9 to call her back in five minutes. Again, Client 9 is alleged to be the governor of New York State. It's going to clean up prostitution. Paragraph 76, at approximately 8.14 p.m., Rochelle called Mark Brenner, a.k.a. Michael, the defendant. During the call, Lewis told Brenner the client nine had just called about an appointment for tomorrow and that he had around $400 or $500 credit. <laughs> hey, I got credit from last time. Where's my credit? Sewall so said that she did not feel comfortable saying the client nine had a four hundred dollar credit when she did not know that for a fact. Sewall so and Brenner talked in the background about whether client nine could proceed with the appointment without his deposit having arrived. At approximately eight twenty three PM Lewis called client nine and told him that the office Yeah, the office said he could not proceed with the appointment with his available credit. After discussing ways to resolve the situation, Lewis and client nine Agreed to speak the following day. Paragraph 77. On February 12, 2008, at approximately 9.22 p.m., Rochelle sent a text message to Kristen. In the text message, Lewis wrote, If D.C. appointment happens, you will need to leave New York City at 4.45 p.m. Is that possible? Kristen wrote back, Yes. Paragraph 78. At approximately 3.20 p.m., Rochelle received a call from... Client number nine. Number nine. Number nine. Number nine. Number nine. During the call, 
Lewis told client number nine that they were still trying to determine if his deposit had arrived. Client number nine told Lewis that he had made a reservation at the hotel and had paid for it in his name. Client nine said there would be a key waiting for her and told Lewis that what he had on account with her covered the, quote, transportation, believed to be a reference to the cost of the train fare for Kristen from New York to Washington, D.C. Lewis said she would try to make it work. At approximately 3.24 p.m., Lewis called Cecil Sewall, a.k.a. Katie, and explained what Client 9 had proposed. Sewall told Lewis she would call her back. At approximately 3.53 p.m., Mark Brenner, also known as Michael the Defendant, called Lewis. Lewis and Brenner discussed the problem about Client Number 9's deposit. At approximately 4.18 p.m., Sewall sent a text message to Lewis at the 6587 number stating, Package arrived. Please be sure he RSVPs hotel. Paragraph 79. At approximately 4.21 p.m., Rochelle called Kristen. During the call, Lewis told Kristen that the package had arrived and that, quote, they, believed to be a reference to Michael and Katie, just got the mail. Lewis told Kristen to get to Penn Station and call her when she picked up her tickets. At approximately 4.48 p.m., Lewis sent a text message to Kristen stating, Train info, departing from Penn Station, arriving at Union Street, Washington, D.C., New York City to D.C., train number 129, departing 5.39 p.m., arriving 9 p.m. How much more specific can this stuff be? Client number nine. At approximately 4.54 p.m., Lewis sent another text message to Kristen, stating, Train info, return trip, D.C. to New York City, train 84, uh, departs 2.14, 8.35 p.m., arrives 11.57 a.m. Okay. Approximately 4.58 p.m., Rochelle received an incoming call from client number nine. During the call, Lewis told client number nine that his package arrived today, and client nine said, Good. That's allegedly the governor, New York State. Good. Lewis asked Client 9 what time he was expecting to have the appointment. Client 9 told Lewis maybe 10 p.m. or so and asked who it was. Lewis said it was Kristen. Client number 9 said that... Wait a minute. Am I missing a page here? Let me see. 77. Client number 9 said... Uh, Oh, she was an American, petite, very pretty brunette, 5 feet 5 inches, 105 pounds. Client number 9 said that she should go straight to room 871, and if for any reason it did not work out, she should call Lewis. Now, I could go on and on here and talk about the negotiations, and there are negotiations here for how much they're going to pay. Uh, client number 9 uh, offered uh, $4,300, and they went back and forth on how much it was going to cost. And uh, all this talk about how the FBI got involved and the trip from D.C. to New York and what from New York to D.C. and what have you. But the bottom line here is this: I love this for the following reason, and it's not the reason you think. Okay, I am a libertarian, a small L libertarian, as we say. I'm not a member of a political party. Not the libertarians, not the Democrats, not the Republicans. Don't belong to a party. But what I do believe is that prostitution is essentially a, it should not be a crime at all. You call it a victimless crime, it shouldn't even be a crime, okay? Because people sell their virtue every day in any number of ways. I'm a prostitute right now, okay? I am uh, I am being paid a huge amount of money to sit here and have this conversation with you, a conversation I would not be having otherwise. That is prostitution like anything else. I don't know why we have such prudes about this. Prostitution should be legal. And that is why I love the fact that client number nine is going to get his uh, his ass kicked here because uh, client number nine is allegedly the governor of New York State, the guy who said he was going to fight prostitution, he's going to clean up prostitution. And I am tired of people who step forward in public and tell us, uh, I am the way, I am the truth, I am as pure as Snow White, I am going to clean things up. There's a new sheriff in town who, when you're not looking, uh, they are out doing whatever the hell they want. So I don't feel sorry for Elliot Spitzer. I feel sorry for his wife. God damn it. Why did you marry a guy like that? And his three daughters, I'll bet they're having just a peach of a time right now. And can you imagine how Elliot Spitzer explained his absence on Valentine's Day to go to the Mayflower Hotel in Washington, D.C.? It's pretty outrageous stuff. But there's nothing I love more than this.
The Tom Likas Show.